I'm really delighted to be joined this evening by Grace Vanderpool, MBE, the first Black diabetes nurse consultant. And it's a real pleasure for to have the conversation with Grace. So Grace, welcome. Thank we've, you, Joan. We've just had a section and a quiz looking at the myths around diabetes. You've worked in diabetes for over 30 years. And you've come across so many of these myths yourself. Today, we're looking at being black, being diagnosed with diabetes. What next? What advice would you give somebody who's recently been diagnosed with diabetes? Thank you, Joan. Um, first of all, I'd like to reassure them that we can, as a healthcare team, multidisciplinary team, we can support them with living with diabetes um, and also to help them to um, understand their diabetes and what to do about their diabetes, how to treat and manage their diabetes and to look at their diet and how they can use that as well as part of the management of their diabetes. So thanks, Grace. I mean, you know, you've mentioned a lot of things in there. And what we aim to do with this series is to unpick some of those things so people get the information that they need to empower themselves to live better with diabetes or if even perhaps if they're at risk of diabetes. So let's unpick a bit of that. So in terms of diabetes, I've, I've said diabetes, but there's two main types. Um, do you want to elaborate a bit on the two types that there are? Yes, there are two types. Um, type 1 diabetes, and this is diabetes where the pancreas, the gland that produces the insulin, um, does not produce insulin to manage and keep the balance of the blood glucose levels. The second type of diabetes is mostly associated with lifestyle. And this starts when uh, over a period, possibly as long as 10 years, where the pancreas um, starts to uh, not produce insulin slowly. And at some point over those 10 years, um, people will develop what we call type two diabetes. Um, and this means that the insulin that they're producing doesn't work as well as it should. So with type one diabetes, the pancreas, which is producing insulin, those cells, the body is not recognizing them as being of themselves and acts against them. So it's what we call an autoimmune condition. Mm. So that, that person living with type one diabetes, their pancreas can't produce any insulin. So they require insulin for treatment. Yes. And with people who are living with type two diabetes, you um, advise us that this can be going on for about 10 years before somebody realizes that they've actually got this condition. So the pancreas, again, is producing insulin but this time maybe not enough or it's not working as it should do and so gradually the blood glucose the blood sugar as some people call it but we're going to call it glucose uh, that blood glucose starts to rise and then that person is diagnosed as living with type 2 diabetes so those are the two main types aren't they and yeah. we know that in certain communities it can be about 90% of people who are living with type 2 diabetes, about 5 to 10% who are living with type 1 diabetes. In the black community, it tends to be about 95% of people are living with the type 2 diabetes and about 5% living with type 1. So specifically in the African, African Caribbean community, that's the sort of um, breakdown of figures, isn't it? Yeah. So that's the diagnosis what next because we've said you know you've been diagnosed with this condition what next you've said that there are lots of people who can help and you mentioned food what would you say are the first things that somebody should do when they get that diagnosis because that can be quite a shock can't it it can be quite a shock and I think that one of the things um we're doing more and more uh, nowadays in when we consult with our, our patients who have developed diabetes is we try to reassure them we try to give them assurance that we can help them and support them by actually working with them 
to understand their diabetes. That's the first thing I think um, is really important that we explain as you have Joan very clearly the difference between the two types of diabetes. We confirm with them which type of diabetes they have. And then we put what we call a clinical management plan in place with them, agreed by them to help to manage their diabetes. And the first things I, I would do in my clinical practice is I would help them to understand what does the blood sugar mean? What, what, is, what is the importance of um, having a good um, blood sugar to prevent the long-term complications? And with that comes um, treatment, medication, and in the longer term, possibly an injectable therapy, um, you know, insulin or a GLP-1. But it's a gradual um, progress towards um, education. And we, we signpost them to what we call a structured education program, where we discuss what is diabetes, what is the type of diabetes they have, and what they need to do to ensure that they, they actually engage with their diabetes, but also to follow the treatment plans that we offer them along with diet and exercise. So, Grace, you've said about a diabetes structured education program. Some people are going to think, I don't want to go back to school. I want to know more about diabetes and want to be more aware of this condition. And as we've said, we want to give information that's going to empower people. So what other methods might they have of learning more about their condition? Uh, so in, in North West London, um, as you know, Joan, we have a very good um, um, website called No Diabetes. And that particular website is very, very clear on the different aspects of diabetes. So they can actually um, access this website on their phone or, or by their um, computers, laptops, etc., And they can have bite-sized sessions. Well, what I mean by that is they can half an hour's journey to work they can look at what is diabetes and then they can actually then um, at the next session they can look at um, diet or they can look at what the annual review contains or what are the different types of treatment and they're very clearly explained in simple language so that people can understand. Yeah and I think it's really important because you know over the years I've had people tell me they've got information from a taxi driver, from their friends and family about diabetes and that information although it's from a trusted person is not necessarily always the correct information so it's really important that you go to sources of reputable information so that can be something like a structured education course as Grace has said but it can also be certain um, webinars like this it can be websites it can be voluntary organizations charities that all provide some information about diabetes so you're diagnosed with this condition why is it important what what's the importance of being diagnosed grace what would you say to somebody say, who says okay you've told me i'm living now with type 2 diabetes what does it matter yeah, it's really important to understand that um, once you have a diagnosis of diabetes, that you um, look after yourself, really, um, and engage with our healthcare professionals to prevent what we call the longer term side effects or complications, if you like, of diabetes. And what high blood glucose does, it can cause damage to the eyes, the heart, the kidneys the nerves in our feet, we can get strokes or heart disease, etc. So it's an opportunity to prevent these longer term complications from happening by looking after yourself, um, eating the right foods, exercising daily and following the um, medication treatment plan for that's been given to you by your healthcare professional. And that could be your GP or practice nurse or a specialist nurse or a doctor with a special interest a dietitian, there are several people within the healthcare team that can help to support you with managing diabetes. 
Grace, I like the way you framed that because you said like a side effect of diabetes and people always think about side effects as being related to things like medication. Um, but actually a side effect of diabetes is the complications, isn't it? Yes, really. um, and I think, you know, we, we all recognize how fantastic and amazing our bodies are, but if we don't look after them the way we should do, and I think we're all guilty of this to some extent, <laughs> then we can open the door to these things happening. So we can open the door sometimes to things like type two diabetes. We can open the door then if you are living with type two diabetes to things like complications as you related to eyes, to kidneys, to nerves, all of those things. But the important thing is, and I think one of the things we want to highlight again with this series is that you can do something about it. You don't have to open that door. It can be that you can do something to improve your life with diabetes. Can we clarify something, um, Grace? Because we've been talking mainly about type two diabetes because type two diabetes, as we've said, about 95% of African, African Caribbean people who have diabetes will have type two diabetes. But one of the myths, Grace, was that people think that black people can't get type one diabetes. Can you say a few words about that? I think that, um, yes, uh, that, that is, has been a myth for a very long time. Um, but um, anyone can get any form of type of diabetes. I mean, if you have a genetic predisposition, uh, what I mean by that is if it runs in families, uh, you, you, you might get type one diabetes. And as you very clearly stated, Joan, earlier in the conversation, is that it's an autoimmune um, condition. And what that means is, as you said, is that the body attacks the cells that actually produce the insulin, so therefore it can't make its own insulin anymore. So in my experience, I have got quite a few patients, um, you know, with type one diabetes who are black, and and they will have to also follow the, the treatment plan that's, um, you know, given to them specifically for type one diabetes. And that means taking insulin injections um, twice, maybe three times, even four times a day. Um, or even, you know, by a different method, uh, something called an insulin pump, which which we can talk about it perhaps in another series. Um, so, yes, yeah, so black people can get type one diabetes. And my experience and further research I've done some years ago, particularly now the second and third generation of black people living in this country, I'm aware that, you know, they have the same risk of developing type one diabetes as any other ethnic ethnicity. Um, white, Asian, or a another in this country. So that we are susceptible to type one diabetes as well, but not as much as type two diabetes. That's really interesting, Grace. Thank you for sharing that insight with us. And another thing I'd like you to clarify for us as well, because some people feel that if you, they are on, let's say, medication that they take by mouth, mm. and then they are given insulin as an additional treatment, they now then have type one diabetes. Could you just clarify that for us? Because I think that is a misconception that um, a lot of people have. Yes, and, and, I, and I find even some clinicians actually, Joan, um, have that concept as, uh, you know, as well. So um, we know that type two diabetes um, is what we call a progressive condition, but we're getting more and more um, research now that you know, with, if it's dealt with early and treated well, we can actually um, put that what, what we call remission. However, um, type two diabetes can progress from what I call from one tablet to two tablets to three tablets. As the cells that produce it, the, the insulin um, uh, you know, die, um, we may need to add in insulin to oral medication. Yeah, and I think the, the really important thing that we're trying to achieve is information empowered empowerment so that people don't follow these progressive steps and actually can do something positive about their health and well-being and living with diabetes so it, let's just clarify if you're taking insulin it may be because you have type 1 diabetes yes. but you can also take insulin as a treatment for type 2 diabetes that's so right. let's just, we're going to focus a little bit on medication at the moment, but that's, 
not our entire focus. If you're on medication, I've heard from people, I can eat what I like because I'm having the medication. So the medication should treat my blood glucose. What do you think about that? Yes, I've uh, also heard that, Joan, many, many, many times. Um, and the way I describe it to my patients is that um, it's a treatment package, not just medication, but diet and exercise is critical. And so um, in terms of diet, managing the amount of uh, carbohydrate foods that turned into sugar into the bloodstream needs to be curtailed, needs to be managed. And a dietitian, a diabetes specialist dietitian, can help with that. So it's about having your diet and exercise as well as your medication and plus or minus insulin um, together as a treatment package to manage the diabetes. So we need to do all these things, um, you know, on a daily basis to actually gain good control of the diabetes. So, you know, some people think that they need to have diabetic foods and I hate to use that word diabetic and I apologize but they feel I need to have diabetic jam I need to have diabetic honey or, or, or that type of foods do people need special foods if they're living with diabetes no they don't no they don't they need to eat um, a healthy diet and um, we need to look specifically at their diet what they're eating when they're eating it and, and compare that with the medication and or insulin so um, a, di a diabetes specialist dietitian would actually look at a food diary, um, you know, from this from the patients, and then help them to um, curtail the amount of carbohydrates uh, to ensure that they're not having too many starchy foods or sweet foods that are actually, uh, you know, turned into sugar in the bloodstream. So they don't need to have special foods; they can have um, healthy foods, normal foods, but in moderation based so, on what their diabetes is doing. Thank you, Grace. And let's talk about sugar, because I was talked in the beginning about glucose, because I think there is a lot of uh, confusion, and I understand that, about sugar and diabetes. Because some people will say, I've got a touch of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some people will say, I don't eat sugar, so why have I got diabetes? Can you just break that down for us? Yes. So um, a touch of sugar, I think, is, is also as a, a myth. Um, and I think that comes from the way, um, you know, in the past, many, many decades ago now, um, the way people were told about having diabetes, you have a touch of sugar with some mild diabetes or, you know, um, you're eating too much sugar. So what happens is, is that it's not that you can't eat sugar, it's amount of sugar that you eat that um, causes us to gain weight. And um, as we gain weight, um, we can develop what we call obesity, which means that you're over what your body mass index should be. And that can cause what we call insulin resistance, which can then lead on to type two diabetes. So what I'm hearing is it's not just about sugar. Yeah. So, and we know that if you eat carbohydrate foods, and that's a huge word, but carbohydrate mm -hmm. foods mean starchy foods. What does that mean? It means yam. It means plantain. It means green banana. It means cassava. It means dumplings. It means potatoes. It means pasta. It means bread. Those foods, when they get into our body, our body breaks them down into what we call glucose. glucose which some people know as sugar. And that glucose is what we're talking about that's raised, that's higher than it should be in our bloodstream. And that's what is happening with diabetes. Yes. So it's not just about sugar. It's about the other foods that you're eating, how those foods can affect your blood. And I'm going to call it glucose, your blood glucose levels, how that can affect then your diabetes or can affect you in terms of making you at risk of developing diabetes or at risk of becoming overweight. And we know that weight is tied in very much with the development of, of type two diabetes as well. So it's, remember, it's not just about the sugar. It's also about the yam, it's about the dumplings, it's about potatoes, it's about bread, it's about 
plantain, is about green banana, is about all of those things as well. So it's really important, I think, Grace, and you, you've mentioned dietitians, but fundamental to what we can do about diabetes if we're diagnosed as living with it is about our lifestyle. So when we use the word diet, are we talking about a specific diet or are we talking about a healthy diet? Just clarify that for us. We're talking about a healthy diet. And um, Joan, I like the way you explain the carbohydrates and the, and the starchy foods, because it's the portions of these foods that you've mentioned that actually raises the blood glucose if you have large portions. And um, I know that you've done a fantastic book and I think everyone should, should, should get it. It's very clearly um, written and it's easy to understand. And it's, it talks about portion control and how much that portion will impact your blood glucose. Thank you, Grace. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to so respect and acknowledge that food like yam, like plantain, like dumplings is good food. It's our tradition, it's our culture. Mm. But having, again, that knowledge to empower you to make that decision, I'm going to have this every day, or maybe I'm going to have a small amount. Mm -hmm. So it's about recognizing and respecting our foods, but how can we make it healthier? Yeah. So talking about that, what else can we do? You mentioned exercise. How, how does that fit in as well? So exercise can help to do a lot of things, actually. And I always say that if I had um, a way of bottling exercise, I think I would be a millionaire. <laughs> but um, exercise is critical because exercise does a lot of things. It helps to manage the blood glucose. It also manages blood pressure. It can help with managing cholesterol, managing weight. And that feel good factor that you get um, will also help and also helps to make your, your insulin work much better that your body's producing. So exercise or physical activity, be it walking, be it, uh, you know, um, jogging, be it just um, going up and down the stairs a few times a day, walking around the garden. I mean, you don't have to put on physical activity gear like where to go down to the gym to exercise, moving around, hoovering, if uh, you know, doing the basic things in, in life uh, will help to manage the diabetes, manage the glucose levels, manage the weight, manage the blood pressure and the cholesterol and therefore, you know, and that feel good factor that we get when we exercise and keeps, keeps us fit and healthy. It's such a win-win, isn't it? And it's, it sounds so simple, but any increase in activity is what we're calling exercise. But I think once we use that word, people get the um, idea of lycra and a gym and mm -hmm. think, well, I can't do that. But actually, while you're sitting watching the soaps, moving your feet if you can, moving your arms if you can is some sort of activity and can actually help with things like blood glucose, your blood pressure as you said, and that feeling better, feeling well in yourself, mentally and physically. So what would you say to somebody who's been diagnosed and is now living with this condition? You know, when, when they go to see their healthcare professional, the healthcare professional will say something about blood pressure, they'll say something about their glucose control, they'll say something about their cholesterol. Um, what would you say are the figures, perhaps, that they should be aware of to know whether things are good or whether they're not? Because you can't actually tell how things are going by the way you feel in terms of diabetes. So what would you say, Grace, when somebody comes to see you, what are you saying to them are the we call it targets, but what yeah. are the goals that they should be aiming for? Yes, yeah, so for the um, bl blood glucose control or what we call the HbA1c or in layman's term, I call it the um, three months um, review of, the, of how your blood sugars are doing. Um, we would aim for um, something like 48 to 53 where patients have not, don't have any complications at all and maybe 53 to 58 um, millimoles per mole, depending on you know, if there are any side effects or as I mentioned earlier, complications. And if they're elderly frail, there may be another number, possibly around 64. Um, and we give our patients these targets um, to aim for 
because we want to prevent the longer term complications or the side effects I mentioned. Grace, and can I just stop you there for one yeah. second? Because I think one of the important things that you've really highlighted is that these are individual targets. Yeah. So we're giving some general ranges here. But mm -hmm. each one of us is an individual with specific circumstances. And for you as an individual, I think the important thing that you've really highlighted, Grace, is that we, you need to know what your goal is. What your, we call it a target as a healthcare professional. But yeah. for you as an individual, what's your goal? You get that information from your healthcare professional so you know what it is you're aiming for. Thanks, Grace. And that was the HbA1c which is looking back at the sort of three month average of your glucose. So okay. blood pressure. So blood pressure, again, um, blood pressure target should be um, around 140 over 80. However, again, this should be an individual target. So that will depend on, uh, you know, whether there are any side effects, whether uh, there's been, um, uh, you know, high, a long standing history of blood pressure. We need to make sure the blood pressure is under control because we don't want to, our patients to get strokes or, or kidney disease, uh, et cetera. So again, that will target will be individualized. And, um, you know, we say the lower, the better um, to prevent those longer term complications. So in my clinical practice, I aim for 120 over 70. But again, individualized based on the whole medical history of the patient. And cholesterol? And cholesterol, we aim for a target of four or below. Okay. So, Grace, another thing that people say to me is, okay, now I've been diagnosed with, let's say, type 2 diabetes. All of a sudden, everybody's so interested in my blood pressure. Everybody's so interested in my cholesterol. And I've been given medication for cholesterol. I've been given medication for blood pressure. Can you just relate to us why that's important now? Yeah, it's really, really important to have, um, you know, to have the appropriate target for the individual, mainly because we want to prevent the long term complications of diabetes. Um, so we know that a combination of high blood pressure, high blood uh, glucose levels, high HbA1c, high cholesterol will put us at risk of cardiovascular diseases. So that could be stroke, heart disease or, or you know, problems with the bigger veins in, 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 in the legs. So it's really, really important that the, you know, the more pay, people stay into, into their or close to their target, the risk of developing these complications are much reduced. So it's a case of being diagnosed with diabetes, adding to a risk, unfortunately, opening mm -hmm. that door to the possibility of these things that we've called complications, mm -hmm. affecting your feet, affecting your eyes, affecting your kidneys. But if you add on top of that, a risk that you might get from things like blood pressure, and then add on mm -hmm. top of that, a risk that you might get from things like a high cholesterol, increasing your risk of these things, the, opening that door to the complications. And so that's why it's important to treat all of these things. But as we've always said, prevention is better than the cure. And in the series, we're going to aim to show you how you can prevent getting to this stage in the first place. But if you are at the stage where you've been diagnosed as living with type two diabetes or, and or type one diabetes, the important thing is that you know what your individual goals are with regards to things like your blood glucose, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and any other risk factors. So that might be getting your eyes checked and getting your feet checked, speaking to a dietitian, raising awareness in whichever form suits you. So that might be going to an education course or something like that. But it's important that you get all the information that you need in order to live healthier with diabetes. So let's look at some specific risk factors because we've said that uh, you know, prevention is better than cure. What would you highlight to us, Grace, are areas that people don't realise they're at risk of developing diabetes? They've got some condition, but they don't realise that that puts them at increased risk. What, what things would you, you highlight from your experience? So um, other conditions um, where they might have to take um, 
long-term steroids that can actually put people at risk of getting diabetes. So those people who are put on steroids for another condition, such as um, arthritis or maybe um, asthma, um, they may be put at risk of getting diabetes. So they need to be made aware of that and to ensure that their doctor and nurse is actually checking um, either six monthly or annually, um, you know, to check for diabetes. Because diabetes, as we said earlier in the discussion, can creep up on you. It can come on over a period of 10 years. And um, so the earlier we can find it, the better we can treat it, or the sooner we treat it, we can prevent all of these risk factors that we've discussed earlier. And one of the areas that I um, am particularly aware of is when women develop diabetes during pregnancy. Yeah. And pregnancy can be, you know, a wonderful time, a baby, and then people forget that they developed diabetes in pregnancy and that that can put them at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life. And so it's, I think one of the things I would like to highlight is that um, when people develop diabetes during pregnancy, it's really important that every year actually afterwards, you should get your blood glucose checked to see if unfortunately you have developed type 2 diabetes. That's not to say it's inevitable. It doesn't need to happen, but you do need to be aware of where you are in that blood glucose range. The other yeah. thing is, I think some people think that if nobody in their family has got diabetes, they can't get it. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's uh, not correct. Um, uh, anyone can get diabetes at any time. And that, that's the thing that we need to be aware that as a black community, we are higher risk. And so we should be screened for diabetes at every um, opportunity. And we're developing it at a younger age. And to me, one of the tragedies is that unfortunately, sometimes children are getting that type two diabetes associated with lifestyle because of things like increased weight and perhaps not enough activity. Uh, children are getting type two diabetes now. Um, so that, that to me is a tragedy. Um, and I think it's something that we're aiming to, to with this raising awareness uh, and these series of webinars, aiming to see what we can do about that. Prevention, as we've said, is what we're, we're trying for rather than having to cure the condition. Um, let's talk a bit about things like the shame, the stigma, the denial, that our communities have around diabetes? Because I think this can sometimes hamper us in doing something to improve our lives with it. Yes, and I think it's not just our community. It seems to me from my experience that um, all communities seem to have this um, stigma around diabetes. And I, I always explain when I do my structured education courses or bite-sized one-to-one um, -one consultations is that there are other things that are out there that are worth to, to get. The good thing about diabetes is that we can treat it and we can treat it very well. We've got a lot of uh, um, medications and insulins and other injectables that we can use to treat it. And we can actually achieve the targets that we want to get for each person by working together. So um, the person with diabetes needs to understand that they're not in this alone that there's a lot of help around. And also if we need to add in other, other healthcare professionals like a um, psychologist who can actually help them to come to terms with the condition and help them to not um, you know, be in denial because being in denial is a recipe for the longer term complications because you're shutting it off, you're not doing anything about it, it's, it's there and you're ignoring it. Um, it's not a good idea to ignore diabetes. Um, because you will end up with the longer term complications, which we're trying to prevent in the first place. So we need to work with each individual to understand what their understanding is, how they're dealing with it, how they're living with it, what support they have at home with it, um, and what support we as a, um, a clinical team, multidisciplinary teams can support them. So we need to embrace them and, and help them to unpick the areas that they are having challenges with. And we do that through our consultation uh, with our patients. And I think we'd like to um, 
draw to a conclusion on a really positive note. Um, but there is absolutely lots of things that you can do to make your life alongside, let's call alongside diabetes so much better um, for some people it's possible to actually reverse it and during the series we'll be talking about how you can possibly reverse it but even if you can't reverse your diabetes your type 2 diabetes you can make it better you can make it live alongside you rather than overwhelm you and I think it's really important that we end on that positive note so okay Ideally, prevention is better than cure. But if you are diagnosed as being living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, it's really important to say you should know what your goals are going to be living with this condition. And we're going to hear from some lived experts shortly. Know what those numbers are. Know what those healthcare professionals are talking to you about, because that is your life and it's really important that you understand what your goals are going to be to make your life better and there are so many things that you can do to make it better and sources of information that we will share with you in order to help you do that to empower you so that you can live better with diabetes. Grace it's been a real pleasure thank you so much for sharing all your years of experience um, in terms of being not just a healthcare professional, but an advocate, such an advocate and an activist for people living with diabetes. I know that so many people's lives have been dramatically, fundamentally and critically changed by you. So thanks, Grace, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Joan, and you as well.